so hi. Uh, I am uh, Monty Taylor. Uh, I work for Hewlett Packard, sit on the OpenStack Technical Committee and also the OpenStack Foundation Board. So basically I spend all of my time doing uh, OpenStack, 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 and just say the word cloud a lot in a lot of contexts. And I'm Mark McLaughlin, and I can pretty much substitute Red Hat for that introduction. I'm at Red Hat. I work in the CTO office there. I'm on the foundation board. I'm on the OpenStack Technical Committee. Um, so work with Monty an awful lot, and both of us are here to share our wisdom. We have so much wisdom. We have so much wisdom we're going to give you. When you walk out of this room, you're going to be full of wisdom. Um, we're going to chat a little bit about um, uh, chat about a, 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 about a few things. We're going to talk about uh, distros, sort of what they are, what the theory is behind those. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about the theory of continuous delivery uh, and DevOps, because I promise you I know everything about DevOps. Um, uh, and then we're going to spend a little bit of time talking about the differences between the two, because it turns out they're, they're dissimilar. Uh, and then ultimately, we're going to talk about how the two of those uh, have, a, have a home in, uh, how both of those have a home in the OpenStack project. Uh, things that we do to, to deal with that, challenges that it's got, uh, and, then, and then ultimately I believe that leads to the wisdom that we've been, uh, yeah. that we've been selling you on. Uh, so I, th I think we'll be kind of going from talking about philosophy and kind of worldview yeah. side See. of things to towards the end talking about some more concrete stuff and OpenStack specific stuff, and hopefully that's where we'll get into you know, some of the more concrete conclusions, I guess. Yeah, yeah. Well, this time we'll actually have, last time we did this, so I don't think we had conclusions. I think we just stopped talking. So, yep. uh, so this, will be, this will be a much more exciting new and improved version. Uh, we'll call it the, the, uh, the Ice House release. Cool. OK, well, I'm going to start talking a little bit about distros. I guess I've been working on uh, Linux distros for over 10 years now. Um, but it's funny. It's like with the advent of DevOps and continuous delivery and stuff like that now, you, you and, and there's a whole lot of literature about the kind of theory and philosophy of those, it's kind of interesting to say, take a step back and try and come up with a concrete description of, say, the philosophy of distros, how distros go about trying to um, you know, create a software pro product, I guess. Um, so I guess the, the first goal of a distro is like, to take um, this disparate set of open source projects, all these open source communities building these great um, projects and off all doing their work separately on different release cycles and stuff, and bring that all together and build a coherent whole out of it. Um, so, and we do that by you know, applying a lot of process, process, a lot of rigor, a lot of re repeatability, and it's kind of from all of that kind of work, that kind of repeated process of doing this over and over and over again, that users um, you know, gain a kind of level of assurance about the quality of, of, of the distro. And one of the interesting things about distros, I think, that's, that's, that, that's really quite different is, you know, it's not like... Um, one software product that does one very specific thing in a, in a kind of very um, fixed way. It's, it's almost like a toolbox, right? It, you, you can take a distro and you can build a whole bunch of different things from it. So there's pretty much an infinite set of use cases for a distro. Um, and so the distro itself can't take on the task of testing every possible way it can be used. Um, so distros rely heavily on their users to contribute their own testing to, you know, when a new version of the distro comes out or an alpha version of the distro comes out, users will take that and test their particular use case, test their particular configuration, um, and give that feedback back to the project then. And, and really that feedback is, is you know, critical to, to making a distro work. And so it's that feedback um, that allows you know, the, the, the product to become um, mature, I guess. So you, 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 uh, distros go through this, this process where they take the, the latest version of everything, bring it all together, it's all completely broken, um, and go through this process of um, gradually getting closer and closer to something that's, that's uh, you know, good quality. Um, but each of those um, phases of the distro going through its release process, different sets of users come in and try out their, their own use case and give that feedback back. Um, so users kind of get this uh, choice of at what point in a distro's release cycle they want to you know, get involved and, and give their feedback. So continuous delivery, on the other hand, uh, and I get to talk about this because I'm currently running a 
production system, large portions of it uh, happen to uh, happen and deploy uh, continuously, um, uh, which some of you may uh, interact with from time to time. Um, so continuous delivery, as opposed to the sort of um, distro stabilization cycle uh, and all of the all of the work that goes into that, uh, is is a lot about uh, about tight tight feedback loops. You you have an idea, you implement the idea, you get it out into production, you learn what works, uh, and and you move on, uh, and then you iterate uh, you iterate uh, quickly, and you want to make sure that the time from development to production is uh, is minimized. Uh, the longer that you take um, to take to between the time that you you develop your change and the time that it gets out, um, typically in, in a process is also the longer that it's going to take you to respond to uh, to errors or or problems in the uh, in the system, uh, and it's uh, it, it means that it's a it's a much longer time for you to be able to uh, to uh, to apply learning that um, that you get from uh, from rolling things out. Um, there's a there's a heavy focus on automation, um, whereas there's a there's a bunch of uh, there's a bunch of sort of human selection work that goes on uh, in the building of a of a distro to be able to roll changes uh, and and new features and, and new bug fixes out into production uh, on a rapid basis. You pretty much are required to have um, uh, automated systems. Um, if if you if you didn't if you if everything was done manually you would basically just have a team of people doing nothing but running install uh, commands over and over again uh, typing 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 and it would be uh, very tedious and extremely error prone um, uh, and so so the the automation allows people to um, uh, to, to roll things out with a much higher degree of uh, of confidence um, one of the things this leads to. Um, uh, and that, that comes in here is that you get to consume risk in, in small batches. Uh, at the San Diego summit, for any of you that were there, uh, Troy in Troy Toman's um, keynote, he was talking about the the differences between in, in how they how they roll out the the public cloud or Rackspace, uh, and was discussing that if they're going to get from well at the time it wasn't from Ice House to from Havana to Ice House um, <laughs> because we hadn't built Havana yet, um, but if you're going to get from what Folsom to Grizzly, um, uh, then you have you have a couple of choices. You can you can wait six months, uh, and then when you go to to roll out the the next release, you can you can roll out six months worth of changes um, all at once and take a really big hit in, in risk uh, and a really big hit in, um, uh, in, in what the differences might be um, because you're going to have to roll out all the changes or you can roll them out the entire time that they're coming, um, which means that each one of them is potentially much more understandable. Uh, it's not just that you read the release notes and say, okay, well, these are the five new features, <laughs> the five new features in, in an OpenStack release. These are the 20,000 new features uh, in this, uh, this OpenStack release. This one, you, you, get them, you get them one at a time. And so um, at even, even to the level of, of being at the patch size, so you can understand really specifically what its impact on your, on your environment is uh, and, and what, in, what things you might have to do to, to mitigate, uh, to migrate. Uh, if you think about database migrations, uh, six months worth of database migrations is going to be a much longer and costlier uh, downtime potentially to, to run, as opposed to if you ran each one of them as, as, they, came, uh, as they came along. Um, the, uh, the other thing that you get in a continuous delivery model is, uh, or that you sort of have to have to make it work, is the shared responsibility uh, across dev and, and ops. And this is, of course, our our you know, favorite word of the, of the decade, uh, DevOps. Um, but specifically, if you're rolling these things out quickly, um, if you're not, uh, if, the, if, the, if the developer doesn't share responsibility with the, with the operator, uh, isn't, isn't uh, part of that tight feedback, feedback loop, um, then the developer's gonna go off in the corner and write some crazy stuff, and it's gonna break the databases at midnight, and, and the ops guy's gonna hate him. And then next time what's gonna happen is the developer's gonna write a change, the ops guy's gonna be like, yep, I'm not deploying that. I don't believe you. I got paged at midnight last time we did this, and I didn't really like that. Um, uh, and so you, you, have to, you have to sort of uh, co-locate and conjoin those, uh, those, operational, um, uh, those operational duties so that, the, so that the developer who's writing things has uh, insight into, right, um, insight into what the, what the effects are and, and actually sort of learn some of the uh, learn some of the pain and learn some of the joy of a, of a, of a lovely deploy that has absolutely no problems in it um, and, gets to, and gets to share that. Uh, and same thing with the, uh, the operator, the operator, that, the, the, the person coming from the operational side in, in working with the developer on the changes then also shares some responsibility, some culpability for what they're going to do and, uh, and has a, an amount of, um, uh, they can develop a, an amount of trust um, between them. And, and I guess what's been, what 
the intent behind all this is to practice what some people call hypothesis-driven development, right? The, the, the business driver behind all of this is you want to be able to have an idea, um, get it out to your users and, and test um, and, and see if that, that, that idea works well. Um, and so, you know, all of this is important, like the tight feedback loop allows you to, to get that feedback. The, 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 the consuming risk in small batches means you're trying out ideas in, in small chunks. And the shared responsibility is, you know, both dev and ops um, sharing that goal of, you know, trying an idea out and getting, getting the feedback back. Oh, looks like we're going to compete with somebody else for talking. That's exciting. Um, so in looking at the, in looking at the, um, uh, the sort of how these two sort of different worldviews um, uh, compare to each other uh, across, a, a, across a few things, um, uh, testing is a, is a good one. As, as Mark said earlier, in, um, in, a, in a distro world, the testing is largely done, um, all this is changing some, but it's largely done at the, uh, at the user level, right? It's um, the, the sheer combinations of things that you could install uh, from, a, from a distro means that you can't possibly test all of them, and so you get increasing waves of, um, uh, increasing waves of testing as it, as it becomes closer and closer to release, closer and closer to, to maturity, more and more people use it, and that testing, the sort of you know, stereotypical open source, many eyeballs, you know, bugs, shallow. Uh, on the continuous delivery side of the, of the page, um, this, is all done, this is all done in highly automated uh, fashion, in fact, because uh, uh, you're, you're trying to catch these things um, uh, before they roll out. Uh, you also sort of have a constrained uh, problem set that you're, you're deploying. You're deploying uh, a cloud, for instance. You're not deploying uh, 700 theoretical clouds. Yep. Um, although <laughs> if you are deploying 700 theoretical clouds, I'd like to hear about that, because that sounds like a lot of fun. It's like the, the, the approach to testing on, on the distro side or the continuous delivery side, it's driven by the kind of constraints, the environment, the, what, what both are trying to achieve. So you know, if you've got a, an infinite number of use cases, you can't hope to you know, automate your testing of those. And if you hope to do you know, rapid releases, um, you can't rely on manual testing for that. So it's, it's, it's uh... And so I guess we've kind of covered some of this, uh, yeah. this already. Um, you know, in the continuous delivery viewpoint, in the kind of dev, DevOps viewpoint, you're typically um, building software and delivering software for very, one very specific use case. You know, if it's going to be a service, perhaps there's only going to be one instance of the, that service, or maybe there's going to be multiple instances of them, but they're all going to be essentially um, configured the same way. Whereas in a distro sense, you've got this kind of almost infinite set of, of use cases, this kind of hard to predict um, you know, it's, it's hard to predict all the way that, that users are going to use it or, or what use cases are, are most important to users. Essentially, there is, there's pretty much there's one Twitter. You know, there's, not, there's not 100 Twitters. There's, there's one, and, and they, they deploy it that way. Um, the, uh, and I, I mentioned this in the, um, in the, in the continuous delivery side. Uh, in, in, in continuous delivery, you want to get a, a sort of almost constant uh, or predictable uh, low-risk um, uh, uh, deployments. You want to you make sure that you understand very specifically what the what the risk level is, and it's okay that there's some risk. Like every every deploy has risk, but you want to you want to understand it yep. because it's, it wants to be predictable because you're going to be doing it potentially multiple times a day, and so in, in doing that you um, yeah. a, uh, you're, a, you're able to mitigate the if, the if fear. If it's a known quantity of risk, if the risk is, is yeah. you know this known quantity, then you can deal with it. Yeah. Whereas with the uh, uh, with the with the distro, the the risk level is is much higher. If I get a new version of uh, the OS on my laptop, it's possible that they might have decided to remove my clock applet that has my, uh, my, my time zone shifting uh, feature on it. Uh, and that's, uh, that's a big risk that I actually don't know until I upgrade my laptop. Uh, and then I discover that half of the if features on the it went away. On the next slide, we've shown the graph on the next slide. So here we're trying to, yeah. I guess, show what we mean about different risk levels, right? In the continuous delivery world, it's this, you know, there's, there's varying level of risks, but it's pretty much a, a straight line. Um, but in distros, you know, you get these releases happening, which, you know, it, you're, if you consume that new release, you're consuming this massive amount of change. There's a lot of risk associated with that. But as the release matures, um, the risk level goes down, I guess. And you know, in the in the in the distro sense, in the releases sense, um, users can choose at what point in that graph they want to rebase to new releases. So they can choose their their risk level, and they can choose to consume the alpha releases and know that there's going to be a large amount of risk with that, or they can wait until you know maybe 18 months later when there's a 0.2 release of rel or something like that. Um, so you know, it's it's that kind of choice uh, for the user of what risk level they want to to use. Yeah, so um, uh, the, the, the idea of, of user choice actually uh, feeds 
uh, really nicely into into the in the idea of feedback loops. In a continuous delivery model, um, the, the the users or the operators of the system have um, or of the software uh, in this case, the the deployers have uh, have chosen to to sort of buy into being a part of the of the feedback loop. It's very important not just to consume or not just to uh, install a thing, but actually to be part of the the creation of that thing. Um, uh, and and this is this is one of the ways to to get the feedback loop. Um, on, a, on, a, on a distro, on the other hand, I might very well passively consume um, as, a, uh, as, as an end user uh, the, the distro running on my, on my laptop, and I may never actually even submit bug reports back, even when my clock applet goes away. Um, I, I might just complain to people at the bar, which doesn't necessarily help the developers fix anything. Um, it just, it just, it's just fun to, to, to bitch about over beer. Yep. Um, and, and it goes to that choice again, right? With, with distros, you have this choice of, you know, at what level you want to start doing your testing. Do you want to do it alpha releases or very stable releases? You're choosing kind of how tight you want your feedback loop to be based on, you know, what you're willing to do. Whereas with continuous delivery, if you're doing that, you're kind of almost explicitly, you know, you've got to be part of this tight back feedback loop. There's pretty much no point in doing continuous delivery if you're not willing to be giving very um, you know, rapid feedback back to the, the developers. And an another form of, of feedback just uh, uh, over and beyond, uh, I'm going to tell Mark that my clock output is gone, um, is, uh, is, is actual contribution. Um, it's, uh, it's, it's essential in, in continuous delivery. You, you, you have to, you have to, <laughs> you have to contribute um, to, the, to the project to get the, uh, the feedback loop. In, um, in, a, in a distro, you can totally choose what level of, of, uh, of engagement you can uh, go and, and develop on, on the distro. But by and large, actually, probably a larger majority of people are going to consume rather than uh, rather than, than participate. Yeah, and, and absolutely. Um, to be clear, we're not just talking here about contributing code. We're talking about contributing, you know, to docs or bugs or feedback in terms of you know sharing what your configuration is. You know, all of that kind of stuff. Um, I think in the continuous delivery world, you really have to be really in there and giving as much feedback as you can, and, or much contribution as, as you can. Whereas distros, you kind of pick what level you want to contribute. Uh, I'm going to let you take this one because it involves uh, name-dropping people, and I'm apparently <laughs> you're extremely bad about that. Yeah, so I guess Monty and I first gave this talk a few weeks ago at um, Red Hat's Dev Nation conference, and um, one, of the, one of the talks there was about DevOps, and there's this, in, in, the no, in DevOps, there's this notion of um, you know, stopping the line, or the, the analogy is used, is given of, of Toyota's, um, and Toyota's uh, manufacturing line, they have this thing called an andon cord. So the idea is that if anyone notices kind of a defect in the manufacturing line, um, the andon cord gets pulled and everybody stops and everybody takes shared responsibility for fixing what, whatever that issue is. Um, and so that notion is very prevalent in DevOps, right? If, if at any point um, in your kind of delivery um, pipeline, say, you know, you're, you're, you've, you've made a change and you're getting that out to production, um, if at any point that um, pipeline breaks, everybody on the team has a shared responsibility for, for fixing that. Um, you know, in the distro's world, there's no, there's no sense of that, right? There's no um, ability for, you know, a user of a beta release of a distro to say, I'm pulling, pulling the andon cord, you've broken my post-fix configuration, yeah. um, everybody stop what they're doing until you fix my issue. Um, there's not quite that sense of... Yeah. <laughs> I think that would be really awesome, actually. <laughs> Every, everyone, everyone involved in the distro, please stop what you're doing. My, my mail configuration is broken. <laughs> um, so, uh, so this is a this is sort of a, an image of uh, of that of the sort of the traditional pipeline, right? You've got a uh, you've got some some changes happening. Um, they go into a. Uh, um, uh, into a, a, a dev, a pre-prod uh, environment, uh, and then eventually uh, roll out into um, into a into a production uh, environment. At any point in, in this in this pipeline is exactly what uh, what Mark was talking about. If you have issues at these transition points, if you have issues in these uh, in these areas, then you you stop and you you don't roll out to the next thing, uh, and and you fix it, um, uh, and you fix it right then. Um, the the interesting thing in the in, in the distribution world, um, and especially as we start getting a little bit closer to talking about um, the combination of these two things, is um, it actually looks a little bit more like this, right? You don't just have one consumer. You don't just have one endpoint for where your software is going to go. Um, it's going out to, to many different people, and those people are going to be consuming it at many different uh, many different uh, points along its 
uh, along its cycle. So you might have an early adopter who's, who's at a further along release. You may have a, a person running a, a different one. So you've got, you've got sort of a, a, a much more scattered, um, scattered thing. So, so this is, this is a, a little bit of the, the ludicrousness of, of any one of those. Nobody on any one of those lines outside of, the, outside of that circle actually has the ability to stop, uh, stop anything running from any of those other lines. They're all, they're all distinct from each other. Um, so if, if it breaks somebody over on the right, uh, the people on the left, they're, they're also going to get broken. Like it's not, it's, it's just, it's already out into the wild, it's already been released, uh, and, and they're just gonna deal with it that way. Um, so um, it's entirely possible we should talk about OpenStack. Uh, really? I mean, it's kind of a weird thing to talk <laughs> about here, I guess. Uh, this is the AWS summit, right? No? Okay, sorry, bad jokes. Um, so uh, we, uh, uh, as, a, as an intro to this, um, and part of the premise of, of this whole thing is that actually OpenStack um, shares uh, many of the, many of both of these features, um, which is particularly an interesting yeah, I, thing. I, I guess to be, to be clear, that's what we're trying to get at here. There's this um, kind of tension, it's a positive tension yeah. almost within the project that we have two types of users, right? We have what we call trunk chasers, those who are trying to stay really close to trunk, trying to do continuous delivery, um, but we also have, you know, um, the distros and the vendors and the, the users of, of distros or whatever, that the more traditional kind of distro model. So we've got a release process and we've got people doing continuous delivery yeah. and we're trying to get to the root of, of how that tension is balanced, I guess. So, uh, so on the off chance um, that some of you don't know this, uh, we, uh, we have a time-based um, time release model here uh, in, in OpenStack. Um, we have uh, many projects. Um, it, makes that, it makes that little circle graph even, even more interesting if you think about that. Um, and we have a growing number of them. Um, we have a growing number of people who come to this. The, just the sheer number of people here in Atlanta is boggling my mind. Um, we, uh, we do keep a stable branch, and this is actually was a, this is a, a uh, we have not always had a stable branch in, in OpenStack. Uh, I believe that the original conversation theory was in Boston, um, but yes. it, was, it was the Essex Summit. It was, uh, it was when theory told me I couldn't do it. Yes. <laughs> Um, uh, the, distro, uh, the distro fellows uh, came in and said, hi, we would like um, to be able to actually, um, uh, because we're releasing something to our users, right, like we're, they're getting it after, after it's been released, um, they're finding bugs and they're reporting them back to us, and we would like to, you know, put those bug fixes somewhere, please. Um, and it was, that, that was the first time that we had ever decided that we were going to actually maintain uh, a, a, a stable, uh, stable release branch, and yes. it's and, and, and I guess been a disaster part, ever since. Part of that kind of notion that a project should have a stable branch is that kind of distro mindset of, you know, we've got a bunch of projects here, we're doing this time-based release process, and, and when we do a release, that's not the end of it, right? When we do um, the Ice House release, we want the ability to do, as a project, we want the ability to do kind of updates of that, that, you know, that the, the, that release will continue to mature independently of the, the, the development branch that's going on. And, and that's, that's really analogous to how distros do things too. Yeah, but from the continuous delivery perspective, or from the just the trunk, uh, you know, master developer, um, uh, master branch uh, development perspective, um, releases are sync points, right? That they're not they're not an end. They're not like I wish that I it was time to throw a party and then go home and just take a vacation. But that almost never happens. Um, uh, we 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 need to sync and we need to just keep the ongoing work. Um, so we around that time we tend to to taper the feature work. Um, uh, to, to, to take care of the, the distro uh, folks a little bit better. Um, this gives us time to sync up on things like documentation or, or, or internationalization. The, the, it, it's, it's kind of tough to document things before they've actually landed um, sometimes, and so the, we gotta give the, the docs guys uh, time to, to catch up with, uh, with us. We need to do things about marketing. We need to let people know what's coming, uh, what they're about to get. And, um. and, and part of the idea with this tapering the feature work is the notion that, you know, okay, we do a lot of automated testing, but users use our software in ways that we don't do automated testing of. So we need this period whereby just everybody slows things down for a little while and gives users the opportunity to to try out their use cases that we're not, we don't have automated test coverage of and get that feedback in before we do a release. Um, and that's, that's the idea with tapering the feature work. The, the last bullet point here I, I'm currently finding a little bit funny um, because uh, every six months, of course, as uh, you clearly know, we have a summit. Um, uh, and uh, and <laughs> it's the take a breather part that, that I find particularly amusing because the last thing that I'm doing this week is taking a breather. Uh, I feel like I want to die from being too tired. Um, but, uh, but in theory, this is supposed to be a, pa a, a, point, a time to pause and reflect upon what we've done uh, and then plan for the next 
next, uh, the next six month cycle. Uh, instead, it seems to be the time where we get together and uh, uh, do piston but, parties. But, um, but the, re the reflection that does happen in the, these design summits are really important. I mean, if you go to any of the design summit sessions here, I mean, one of the sessions we had yesterday was a real meta issue about kind of how we all work together as humans and how we kind of have more empathy for each other when we're trying to contribute work that isn't appropriate, uh, whatever. But that opportunity to have that kind of um, reflection is, is just really important to how this project works. And if we didn't have these synchronization points, we wouldn't have that opportunity. Yeah. We also wouldn't have the opportunity to see Josh McKenty dance in a gold lame uh, bodysuit, um, which I hope everybody saw. Um, uh, so there's a there's some uh, there's some cultural uh, aspects to um, uh, that that we share. I'm, I'm supposed to try and you're supposed to do this. this. We, we we got our sequencing backwards yeah. there. We, we were reviewing the slides before this year, and we were a bit confused about the point we were trying to make here. So I, the point I'm trying to get to here is. Um, if you do a lot of reading about DevOps, um, one of the things you'll hit is um, John Willis talking about CAMs, um, culture, automation, measurement, and sharing. And, and he always say, it says it's CAMs, not AMs, right? It's, it's not just about all this technical stuff around automation metrics and, 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 and uh, sharing. It's also about the culture. The culture is really critical to, get to, to be able to have the kind of high-performing organization that you're aiming for with DevOps. And, what we're trying to get at here is we have a good amount of that kind of culture that's required for that, we think, within the OpenStack project. So we've got this you know, emphasis on automated testing. And, and you know, it's so valued within the developer community. Um, and that's actually, I think, highly unusual in open source projects, this, this, this love of automated testing and, and the feedback from that and the insistence that we're going to stick to that, even if I don't know, the gate breaks and people can't merge patches for a couple of days or whatever, we're willing to take that pain because we value this so much. And, and I think that's a really positive as aspect of our culture that's um, really important to, to being able to do some of this stuff. Yeah. The, um, the, the if, if it's not tested, it's broken. I think, uh, I, think I mean, it's, it's not a complicated sentence, but uh, I think it was, it was Russell that, uh, that said that a, a little while ago, and I think it, it, it's it's extremely apt, and I think you can see you can see this reflected in a lot of the content um, on on people's various T-shirts that have been made for the for the summit this time. Um, the the but it worked in DevStack. Uh, one comes to comes to mind. Um, that's that's the that's the type of thing that arises out of a culture of people who are clearly doing um, doing these sorts of activities and and these these are the things we're sharing with each other about uh, about our, our shared experience of, and actually, of dealing with them. Th there's a point there that's really important too that that's maybe not generally appreciated. So I'll use the example of Rackspace, right? And this has kind of been true from the very very early days of the project. Um, you know, these guys are trying to run Trunk pretty much. Um, and they've built this kind of relationship and trust with the developers, the upstream developers, not necessarily Rackspace developers, such that if they try and go and deploy to Trunk and find that it's broken, they can very quickly get um, that issue reverted. And that, that opportunity is really there, uh, available to all operators, right? It's, it's to build that kind of trust and that feedback loop. Um, and the project, the, the, the developer team really has the culture to, to really embrace that and really respond rapidly to that kind of feedback. Right. Um, so we uh, uh, just to just to give we have some we have some challenges uh, that we have to we have to deal with in the um, in the OpenSec community, and, or, or you can consider these um, uh, uh, what is it opportunities? I guess uh, we're yes. supposed to call them not not challenges. Um, so we have we have a very highly uh, active developer base. This is uh, this is a view of. Um, uh, the last 120 hours, um, uh, like from I think I made this graph two days ago. So the little spike on the on the right hand side is actually Monday, um, and uh, you can you can see that even even there we've got developer activity uh, on the on the first day of the summit, even when 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 people are here. Um, obviously, we had a, a whole bunch of it last week, um, but we've got we've basically got a constant steady stream of uh, of activity happening. The green line at the bottom. Uh, might look a little bit more like the um, uh, like the the continuous delivery uh, risk line from from earlier. Um, those are those are the those are the new patch uh, those are the new patch sets that are being uploaded into the into the system. 
Um, the other ones are the code review comments, so we have a, a lot of that going on. Um, but it's, it's a fairly constant rate, and actually the, the line below it is the fairly constant rate of patches that are getting merged. Um, so we're not, we're not waiting till the end of the week, we're not waiting until the end of the month to, to do a big, uh, a big merge window, um, although I, I know that that's a, a fun game that some people like to play. Um, we, we, have to, we, have to handle, um, we have to handle this at scale. Um, uh, and we have to, uh, we, this, this leads to numbers around the, I, I believe the, the, the last time we measured it, we're landing about 10,000 changes every 42 days. Um, so, uh, which, is, which is quite astounding. Um, uh, and gives some challenges to our, our folks following continuous, a continuous delivery model. Yeah. Um, but also it's breaking them up in small enough. They're small enough that we can actually, that we can actually land those changes. Yeah, absolutely. I, I think it kind of shows that, you know, that, that this volume of change happening, um, you as a user as an op are, are, are an operator kind of have two choices, I guess, to, to kind of follow the distro route of kind of you know, choosing to consume maybe every six months and, and kind of dealing with it that way, um, or you go the continuous delivery route. But, you know, there's such a volume of change here, um, you know, there's kind of no halfway house of, yeah. you know, it's, it's you've got to really go in for the continuous delivery route and be willing to kind of give that feedback upstream and really build that relationship with upstream, or you go the kind of the more distro route. Um, yep. um, We've also got, so we've got all of those changes coming in. Our, our developers are producing 10,000 changes every 42 days, um, but it's not just our, it's not just our software. Um, Open, OpenStack uh, is, I guess, ap aptly named with the word stack in it. Um, it, is, it is a stack of things. There's a, there's a, a bunch of Python code we wrote. Um, there's a whole bunch of Python libraries, uh, I believe, over somewhere around, um, uh, gosh, like it's over 100, 150, that's non-OpenStack. Uh, oh, right, oh, yeah. There, there's also a whole bunch of uh, other distro things. So, like your your various C libraries, you've got you know your databases, MySQL, uh, Rabbit, uh, any of these types of things. The the kernel, libvirt, whatever it is, those things are going. Each of these things also has a life cycle, right? So, in in a way, even though OpenStack is uh, not just from a from a methodology perspective. Um, of how we're going to deliver OpenStack, OpenStack itself is is a is a distro in in many ways because we're we're collecting in um, life cycles from other people. So even if we were one cloud, right, and even if we were um, just all operating one cloud in a, in a perfectly DevOps manner, um, we're getting changes from people who aren't us, right? So we more frequently than I might like to to admit, um, do get ourselves uh, messed up when uh, when an upstream Python library might make a breaking change um, without uh, incrementing their their major version number um, because they're just evil evil people. Um, but this happens. This is a real thing. And just as much as um, there isn't a direct cord that 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 we can uh, that can be pulled to sort of stop somebody at, at one of the the people doing continuous delivery. Um, on us, we, it's it's a there's there's a there's another set of things that are feeding into this that are sort of also out of our out of our feedback loop and out of our out of our control, other than you know doing direct tying. Um, cool. And yeah. okay, well, I guess you know constant theme this week. I think I was only in a design summit session about upgrades um, maybe an hour ago. Yeah. But yeah, upgrades clearly in terms of people consuming what we deliver. Um, you know, if you're if you're going the continuous delivery route, you have to have an approach to upgrades that kind of allows you to kind of consume these changes regularly. Um, whereas distros, you're trying to consume from, you know, do upgrades from release to release. And I guess the point here is that the project attempts to um, support and facilitate both type, types of upgrades. Um, so, you know, we do have multiple people running continuously delivered clouds. Um, and, the, you know, the, the, the approach there, um, you know, we have to take, we basically have to support commit to commit upgrades, right? So we have um, RPC API versioning. So every, every change that's made um, in the interface between uh, components within some of the projects, each of those um, interface changes are versioned to allow kind of mixtures of, of, of versions. Um, and we also have this approach recently to database migrations. Um, or we're trying to perfect this approach to database migrations that allows us to, to do kind of commit to commit um, no, down, no, no downtime DB migrations. Um, but I guess getting this right, 
for both use cases is the kind of challenge yeah, we have it's, here. It's a real <laughs> trick, because doing the commit to commit is all, all well and good, but also if you've got somebody who's consuming from a, from a distro, then that person may be doing Grizzly to Havana or Havana to Icehouse. So on every, every commit, we've got to make sure that the commit can get there from the last commit, but also it's got to be able to, be able to migrate and, and get there from, from the last stable release as well. Um, and so we sort of have to, to do the, the double duty thing, um, which, is, which is pretty exciting. Um, ultimately, though, a lot of the things that make these things work and a lot of the things that make, uh, uh, make a, 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 a continuous delivery model work are, are the feedback loops. We mentioned that earlier. Uh, you, want, you want them to be as tight as possible. You want to, you want to get the feedback from the people who are consuming this so that you can, so that you can make your, your product better. And you, you need this in the, in the distro world as well, um, but the timing of it uh, works a little bit differently. Um, so. Um, so what, what really winds up happening um, is rather than there being sort of a, a, a clear and uh, an open um, view of, of, the, of the software delivering is actually sort of this, this little thing in the center here is, is, can be a bit opaque, right? Not everybody in the world knows everything that we're doing inside of our, inside of our development uh, process at OpenStack, even though it's all open and you know, on, the, on the internets and you're all welcome to participate, this doesn't mean that if you're consuming the software that you necessarily are, right? And so if, if, you're, if you're not um, participating in the feedback loop, if you're not, if you're not contributing um, back or talking back or, or, or um, spitting with us, um, then you, uh, uh, the, the feedback loop is a little bit messed up. So, yeah, so what, what, what you then kind of find is like this developer community we have, um, you know, from the outside, it kind of can seem a little bit of an un, unpenetrable mass, and this feedback is trying to get into this un, unpenetrable mass. At least that's, you know, the perception where are the, the feedback we're getting, I guess. We're talking about feedback, about feedback now. But yeah. um, you know, I guess this is one of the big challenges we constantly have to um, you know, embrace and we're, we're trying to work through. You know, how do we allow this, this kind of feedback um, to get into the project and, and for the, 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 the project not to be seen as so impenetrable and opaque? Yeah, because what we actually want is we want, we want this. Um, if we can get, if we can get, uh, if we can get these, these feedback channels working, right, if we can get um, uh, if we can get the people who are, who are consuming this, whether it's at the distro model or the continuous delivery model, if we can get that feedback in, in here into the middle where the, where, the, where the development action is happening, then we actually have a better chance for, uh, for, uh, for reaction, better chance to react quickly. Uh, occasionally this works well, like, like Mark's example with the, um, uh, the, our, our public cloud operators being able to come in and say, hey, listen, no, seriously, you just broke my cloud. Um, we, have to, we have to fix that. Um, but this is, this is available to everybody, and this is the, the thing we're, um, we're really wanting to, to, the place we're wanting to get. Um, and, and ultimately, in, in order to do that, it's, uh, it's actually, it's about trust, right? Like, you've got you've to trust um, uh, you've got to trust us to give us feedback. Yep. Um, you've got to, we're, we're, giving, we're giving you software, but uh, there's, there's feedback. We were just talking recently about trying to get uh, logs uh, and configs from our operators um, because we have some questions about what they're actually doing. Um, and uh, for them to start giving us <laughs> their production logs and copies of their production configs, that, that takes trust to get that, to the, get that feedback loop happening, yep. right? I think, I think this is like one of the, the biggest learnings maybe the project has to take from you know DevOps and DevOps practices, it's um, you know it's not a case of you know go read Jez Humble's continuous delivery book and say okay that's what OpenStack should do, but it's more the kind of meta question of um, you know in DevOps you're trying to build this sense of shared responsibility, this, this trust between the developer side and, and the and the operator side, um, and I think we're embracing that problem within OpenStack and we're starting to see some you know some positive changes along there. So I really enjoyed the operator summit this week and yeah, just seeing fantastic. some of the, the operators now being willing to really talk openly about their deployment architectures, their network architectures, the problems they've seen and share information between them but also kind of give that uh, trust the developer community with that with that feedback I guess. Exactly right, and, and ultimately that, that in and of itself becomes a feedback loop. The more the more the sort of trust happens, uh, the more the more you get us working together, the more we get us working with the, the folks in the community, and, and then ultimately uh, we we all actually can participate uh, together in making sure that that each of these each of these releases and each of these each of these commits we're landing is actually doing the things that we all need it to do. And with that, amazingly enough, we are uh, pretty much exactly at time. We are just exactly at a time, and this strange. is our big. I guess our yeah. big hope for the future, right? Yeah. This big building up of trust and this, you know, we're seeing more progress on this and we want to continue to see more progress. That's right. Anyway, thank you very much. Mm.